Circuit QED stands for Circuit Quantum Electrodynamics. It's the study of electrical circuits that operate at microwave frequencies, frequencies uh, comparable to those used in cell phones, for example. And they are superconducting circuits. They're cooled very close to absolute zero so that there's no resistance electrical resistance or dissipation of energy. And the goal is to make these electrical circuits behave like quanta, uh, quantum mechanically, to behave like atoms that have quantized energy levels. And we study uh, the interaction of those atoms, or artificial atoms, with quanta of light with photons, but it's not ordinary light, visible light, it's um, microwave uh, frequency electromagnetic waves. And we're sort of used to the idea that visible light comes in photons in discrete lumps of energy, but even microwave photons with 10,000 times less energy also are particles and come in discrete lumps. So we know from the theory of quantum mechanics that atoms, the electrons in atoms, orbit uh, in discrete energy level uh, orbits, and they, if they make a transition from one orbit to another, they can do that by emitting or absorbing a photon of light. So we'd like to make electrical circuits which have quantized energy levels. They, they, the energy takes on only certain discrete values. In quantum mechanics, the size of the energy change when you go from one level to another is determined or determines a frequency. And in atoms, those frequencies correspond to typically visible light or even ultraviolet light. In these electrical circuits, it's a much lower energy change and it corresponds to a microwave frequencies where the the light, the microwaves are oscillating relatively slowly, only five to 10 billion times per second, as opposed to 10 to the 15 times per second as occurs in visible light. So in circuit QED, the circuit element that plays the role of the artificial atom is a small antenna about a millimeter long that's split into to two halves and the two halves are connected by a small circuit element called a Josephson junction. In a superconductor the electrons travel together in pairs uh, flowing without any electrical resistance and a Josephson junction is a um, small barrier that you would think would prevent electrons from traveling from one half of the antenna to the other. But because electrons are also waves, they're able to tunnel quantum mechanically through this barrier and uh, slosh back and forth between the two halves of the antenna. So the uh, in the ground state of this artificial atom, there's very little of this uh, sloshing of charge back and forth, and in the excited states, there's uh, more and more. So that corresponds to, if you're familiar with, let's say, the picture of the, the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom. The electron is in some orbit, like a planet around the sun, and then it can be in a bigger orbit and a bigger orbit, and the uh, that corresponds to the different excitation levels of the, the real atom, the hydrogen. And uh, in this 
artificial atom in this uh, electrical circuit, it's the sloshing of the charge harder and harder back and forth across this antenna that corresponds to the excitations. Now, when you have an antenna and a charge is moving back and forth, current is flowing in the antenna, then it can radiate radio waves, just like the um, uh, antenna on your cell phone, for example. And those radio waves are photons. They can travel to another part of the circuit and be absorbed by another artificial atom, another one of these antennas with a Josephson junction. So in circuit QED, you get these artificial atoms talking to each other by exchanging microwave photons. And so you can communicate quantum information from one place to another. In particular, I, I said that um, quantized energy levels are, are one of the hallmarks of something behaving quantum mechanically. But even more importantly is the fact that you can be in is the superposition principle. You can be in a superposition of the ground state and the excited state at the same time. So in a quantum computer, the quantum bit can be both zero and one, which is where the, the power of the quantum computer comes from. And you can transfer that superposition of zero and one to another um, atom in the circuit, artificial atom, by use of these exchange via these emission and absorption of photons. So real atoms are pretty small. They're hard to see. They're hard to hold on to. Uh, if you do hold on to them, you perturb their properties. Uh, on the other hand, they have a lot of great properties. That's why they're used in atomic clocks. They have very precise frequencies. They have, they, you can put them in superposition states for a long time, so they have many advantages. These um, artificial atoms are made um, by evaporating uh, aluminum, which is the superconductor, onto a substrate by a process that's very similar, electron beam lithography, very similar to the same process that's used to make um, the computer chips that are in your laptop. So in principle, not yet in practice, but in principle, you can imagine scaling up this process and manufacturing uh, structures with first tens and then hundreds and then thousands uh, someday of these qubits by uh, manufacturing methods that are relatively straightforward. The qubits are sort of glued down on the substrate. They don't. They don't. Uh, fall under the influence of gravity the way atoms do, they, they stay there. Uh, you can engineer their properties if you need them to be bigger or the antenna have a different shape, you can just change your design. So there are a number of uh, advantages in that sense that they're more engineerable than um, ordinary atoms or ions. Nobody knows yet what is the optimal hardware to use to try to build a quantum computer. People are using atoms, trapped ions, uh, spins and semiconductors. There are many different ideas and there's no clear winner yet. But the rate of progress in using superconducting qubits over the last 13 years since the first one was built by the NEC group in 1999 has been really fantastic. The length, the coherence time, the length of time that you can maintain a quantum superposition of the ground state and the excited state started at, at essentially zero in 1999 with the first qubit, of maybe one nanosecond, let's say. And today uh, we have coherence times that are um, 150,000 times longer than that. So there's been a real uh, exponential growth in the ability to engineer the quantum states of these systems. And 
um, each order of magnitude longer time is harder than the last order of magnitude to achieve, but so far it's been uh, showing uh, really exponential progress. So it's still very early stages. We're still in some sense, we're not trying to build the quantum version of the Pentium processor. We're still trying to discover the quantum version of the vacuum tube. And, then we'll get to the transistor, and then we'll get to the integrated circuit. It's still very early days. But we think this um, circuit QED architecture uh, looks promising in terms of uh, being able to eventually scale up to large sizes. So the the thing which gives a quantum computer its great power is the ability to put the bits, the quantum bits, into superposition states and into fancier superposition states called entangled states. And that same feature that gives the computer its great power is also its Achilles heel. It, it's, um, quantum system will remain in a coherent superposition state only if you don't look at it, only if you don't measure it. And it doesn't have to be you personally, the experimenter, that measures it. It could be some uh, coupling of the qubit to a noise source or to the environment, uh, to some other part of the circuit where you lose the quantum information. So. This, this is a kind of new field of quantum electrical engineering in which we have to understand how to, get it, how to take a device which is exquisitely sensitive to tiny noise and sources and perturbations and isolate it to the greatest extent possible from the environment. So this five orders of magnitude progress that we've made in the last decade came from um, rethinking the design of these artificial atoms and changing it and go going to different uh, kinds of structures. So in order to keep, to make those structures as insensitive to the external perturbations as possible. But the engineering challenge is that you can't you want the system to be completely isolated from its environment during the computation, but you want it to be strongly coupled to your control device when you program the computer, when you give it the data. Then you want it to be completely decoupled from everything. And then at the end, you have to measure the final state of the computer to get your result. So now you have to be very strongly coupled to a measurement apparatus. And so you have these conflicting engineering requirements of extreme isolation and extreme coupling to your measurement apparatus. And uh, getting that uh, enormous on-off ratio in the size of the couplings is, is, is a big challenge.